Jehovah has always used eccentric characters to accomplish his purpose. Like Noah, the 500 year old man who built a big wooden box to save all the species of animals from extinction. After saving the world, Noah planted a vineyard, got absolutely smashed, cursed his grandson, and refused to elaborate. Or Abraham, a wealthy merchant turned desert nomad. This mad lad was willing to do anything for Jehovah, especially if it involved cutting stuff, either slicing the foreskins of all the males in his household, or slicing the throat of his beloved son in obedience to God. Now that's what I call having faith. How about Samson, who, using the jawbone of an ass, destroyed a thousand Philistine warriors, and once captured and blinded, ended his life in a murder-suicide like a Bronze Age ISIS fighter. Or did I mention he had beautiful hair? Elijah, one of the final prophets of Jehovah, challenged 400 priests of Baal to a showdown. He not only gave his opponents every advantage possible, but he actively mocked Baal, saying that he was probably busy in his divine toilet. He then proceeded to execute all of the priests. Let's not forget about Jesus of Nazareth, son of God who preached in the countryside, flipped some tables, cursed some fig trees, carried the sins of humanity on his shoulders, and came back from the f***ing grave to spook his friends. Yes, Jehovah has always been great at picking out men to fulfill his purpose, but 2000 years later God is still hand selecting certain individuals to carry out his will. Who are these two blessed men who have been chosen? What incredible feats of faith have they carried out? What an exciting time! Come season is here, and with the new come requirements for pioneers, many of us can now share in the come work. We received a very exciting announcement. On January 18th, 2023, Brothers Gage Flegel and Jeffrey Winder were appointed to serve as members of the governing body. We're happy to have them with us here in the studio. And we'd like to spend a few minutes together so you can get to know them a bit. Well, brothers, we understand that you were both raised in the truth by your Christian parents, so... Being raised in the truth is just cold speak for being indoctrinated by a Jehovah's Witness parents. <laughs> These boys don't know of any life outside a watchtower. What helped you to come? Having parents that were well grounded in the truth really did make a big difference uh, to help us children choose the right path. And we always knew and loved the truth. But as I got older, particularly in my uh, mid-teen years, the truth really became more personal and more, more real to me. It's fascinating to me how Jehovah's Witnesses use this language of making Jehovah more real to yourself. Isn't Jehovah supposed to be the realest being in the world? Someone whose very existence is clearly evident in the observable universe? The truth can't become more real to you. The truth is what the facts are. You either accept the facts or you don't. Belief without evidence is what requires blind acceptance, which is exactly what Jeff is describing here. It's almost like it kind of went from black and white to color as it became more personal in that way. And the district convention in 1985, as it was then called, uh, had a deep impact on me, particularly the baptism talk and the uh, concluding talk really spoke to me. And I could tell I was just beginning to make the truth my own during that time. So by the following year, beginning of the calendar year, I dedicated my life to Jehovah and got baptized. Very nice. Thank you, uh, Brother Winder, for sharing that. Gage, we'll ask you the same question. Get your thoughts on it. Well, as was true with Jeff, uh, home was fertile soil for my brothers, and my sister, and me to uh, grow spiritually. What motivated you to pursue full-time service and Bethel service? And Jeff, please. Uh, for me, a good association had a, played a, a big role. Um, as it turned out, at the circuit assembly that I got baptized, uh, several other young brothers from our congregation got baptized as well. And at the end of that assembly, it occurred to us that we could auxiliary pioneer now. And so we decided to do it the very next month. And we loved it so much. We, we pioneered the following month and all through that summer. And by then we were hooked. We loved it. And, and three of us went directly into to regular pioneering from there. They were hooked? Like you would get hooked on meth or cocaine? And for Bethel service, um, my two older brothers served at Wallkill uh, before me when I was just a teenager. And we had an opportunity to visit while they were there. And just seeing Bethel and seeing all that took place there really instilled in me the desire to want to serve at Bethel when I uh, became old enough. So Jeff started serving in Bethel almost straight out of high school. No time for college or anything. Very good. And Gage, what motivated you? 
Well, full-time service was the right thing to do. I found this line super fascinating. Full-time service was the right thing to do. Not the joyous thing to do or the thing I love to do. <laughs> the right thing to do. JWs are very duty-oriented. They knock on doors and go out preaching in awful weather, mostly out of a sense of duty because they believe this is what God expects from them. They carry out all these activities even if they don't personally enjoy them. And believe me, most JWs don't really enjoy knocking on your door. Uh, to me, dedication to Jehovah and serving Him in the fullest capacity possible go hand in hand. So that was always the, the goal that my parents had set before us. Uh, we always had special full-time servants that would stay at the house, circuit overseers, uh, Bethel family members. They would stay and seeing their joy is something that motivated me along those lines as well. So these two men were motivated to serve full-time by observing the example of many people around them, their parents, their siblings, and their spiritual brothers. Basically, their entire social structure revolved around life as a Jehovah's Witness, a very insular, religiously saturated environment. At age 12, I was able to attend a Bethel meeting at the regional convention back at that time, and so it became crystallized in my mind that that's the direction I wanted to go. I'm sure that to attend these meetings in the conventions, you have to be baptized. So now we know that Gage was baptized basically as a child, sometime before turning 12. Oh, but JWs are opposed to child baptism, eh? Very good. Well, you started at a very young age, having an interest in Bethel service. That's delightful to see. Third question for you. What have been some of your assignments at Bethel, and how have you benefited from them? Jeff? Well, I began Bethel at Lock Hill, and my first assignment was in the cleaning department. And for me, starting Bethel service in cleaning was, was an excellent way to start because Bethel can really teach you some very valuable qualities like obedience and patience and humility. It's very telling that the first quality that Jeff mentioned was obedience. Everyone who wants to serve in Bethel must be obedient and compliant. Absolutely no dissent is tolerated in headquarters. And starting off in a support department like cleaning, I felt like it really gave me a good head start in developing these qualities that would be useful the rest of my life. Uh, after that, I was transferred to the farm department, and I worked in uh, what was like produce processing at Wallkill. And again, just a lot of fun. Good brothers and sisters that we worked there, spiritual men and women, a lot of hard work, but one that uh, I thoroughly enjoyed. And it was about three years that I worked in that department. Uh, and then um, I was transferred to the office, and that began a period of about 22 years of serving as a secretary for various brothers and various aspects uh, of the work. Well, Jeff started from the very bottom of the Bethel ladder, literally scraping shit off toilets and slowly worked his way up until reaching the highest position possible in this religion. I mean, these two might be delusional cult leaders now, but you gotta give it to them. They, they worked their ass off to get here. Well, thank you, Jeff, for going through that background with us. Uh, we enjoyed hearing that. And Gage, not for you, what have been some of your assignments and the benefits that have come from that? Well, I started working in the bindery. I worked at the bindery for eight years, and that taught me the value of being punctual, working hard and getting the job done, even if it was very hot, conditions weren't always the best. So Gage was working in basically a sweatshop. <laughs> at least he wasn't scraping shit off toilets. Then I was transferred to the service department. Thank you very much, Gage. We enjoyed hearing that background from both of you brothers. We love having you on the governing body, and we wish you Jehovah's rich blessing uh, on your new assignment. It's wonderful to see Jehovah's people busier than ever in kingdom work. Eh, but are they really, Ken? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have never been so disinterested in the ministry than right now. <laughs> From what I can observe with my family, door-to-door -door service groups are almost non-existent now. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about, Kenny? We know this memorial season will be filled with joyful activity as we search for honest-hearted ones in the ministry. May Jehovah richly bless each of you, dear brothers and sisters. From the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, this is JW Broadcasting. There you have it, boys and girls. A short introduction to the new members of the governing body, God's mouthpiece on earth. I only showed you a small part of the interview because, as you can tell, these are not the most exciting men on the planet. So I don't want you being bored of your mind and bailing on me. So if you want to see the full interview, you can check it out in the Borg's website. 
I don't know why you would do that, but who am I to judge? <laughs> That's all for today. See ya.